So, Just Be Well. Here's the book, actually, and I'm going to explain why I call it Just Be Well in just a moment. But first, I want to talk for a minute about this thing we call evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is, in theory, a wonderful idea. You know, you take the research, the best research, and you apply it to an individual. So, there's this paper from 1996 where it says, you know, evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions. Well, that's great. And then at the bottom, it says, good doctors use both individual clinical experience and the best available external evidence, and neither alone is enough, which that seems like a good thing. So this paper suggests um, it's clinical experience, patient preference, and clinical research. And right in here would probably be the very best things that you could do because everybody agrees. So then this comes along, and this is a few years later, and it says evidence-based medicine de-emphasizes intuition, unsystematic clinical experience, and pathophysiologic rationale as sufficient grounds for clinical decision making. So in other words, they have taken patient preference out of the equation, and they have taken uh, clinical experience out of the equation, and now what we're left with is only research as a reasonable thing to use in medicine. Then this guy comes along. Actually, even before that last paper, in, 19, in 2005, he comes along and he says, well, gee, there's increasing concern that most current published research, which research findings are actually false. He also says that uh, simulations now show that for most study designs and settings, it's more likely for research claims to be false. And finally, he says that uh, generally speaking, most research being done today is simply an accurate reflection of the uh, current prevailing bias. Now, it's not just uh, this gentleman. Uh, there are many other people doing this kind of research. In fact, right here in Minnesota, this is from the journal called Proceedings of the Mayo Clinic. And they say that the conclusions of this paper are, by the way, the name of it, a decade of reversal, an analysis of 146 contradicted medical practices. It's common for what are considered to be mainstream medical practices to be contradicted. And in fact, it happens on an annual basis. The editorial in the same uh, journal said that when they reviewed the Cochrane database, so the Cochrane Library is a group of people who put together sort of the, the crowning jewel of evidence-based medicine. And when they looked in uh, 2004, they said, gosh, only about 50% of the things we're looking at actually have enough evidence to support their use. And yet, you know, people in mainstream medicine are saying, you have to do evidence-based medicine. Well, by this study, it suggests that half of the stuff that doctors do every day, we shouldn't be doing at all. So then they updated. They said, okay, well, it's, now it's several years later, 2011. Maybe we should look at it again, because certainly we've made progress. Well, no, we haven't made any progress. So now we're left with this. Uh, oh, I thought I took that out of there. Okay, well, this is uh, interesting. This is an analysis of the overall level of evidence behind Infectious Disease Society of America practice guidelines. So the Infectious Disease Society of America is a group of infectious disease doctors. They're the doctors that treat the most difficult infections. You know, if you're in the hospital and you have that you know, thing you read about on the, in the paper or on the TV and it's the flesh-eating bacteria or something. They're the doctors you're going to be consulting in the hospital. And what we found that the conclusions, uh, more than half of the current recommendations from the in Infectious Disease Society of America are based on level three evidence. Level three evidence means opinion. It's the opinion of their physicians. It's not based on evidence. Uh, so it's opinion-based evidence only until more data from well-designed controlled clinical trials becomes available. Physicians should remain cautious when using current guidelines as the sole source of uh, guiding patient care decisions. When it's like anything in life. When something gets published, it takes a life of its own. The original idea of evidence-based medicine and of practice guidelines were that they were going to be a starting place, not the end. 
But after they get published, it becomes, quote, standard of care. And then in our litigious society, the attorneys get a hold of it, and now it is the way to do medicine, not a way, the way. So it goes from being the alpha, just the starting place, to being the alpha and the omega. <laughs> and when it becomes the alpha and the omega, now your doctor's hands are tied. But as this analysis shows, the reason why this study was done, by the way, is because this guy right here, Lee, he uh, had a patient die when they were utilizing the protocols very rigorously, and he was angry because he wanted to do something different than the protocol uh, recommended, and the hospital um, pharmacy board wouldn't let him because that was this is the protocol. So uh, he took all, he took the whole thing apart, and he did this study to show that just because it's a protocol doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. So we come to evidence-based medicine. Well, we just, we had these things taken away from us, and now a rigorous review of, of research suggests that there is no research because it keeps flip-flopping back and forth. We all have the experience of watching the TV and they say, coffee is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's gonna cure this, that, and the other thing. And then the next day, somebody's on the TV and they're saying, oh my gosh, coffee causes bladder cancer or it causes this or causes that. So how do you know? But that's the kind of flip-flopping we're talking about. So the data that we need to practice evidence-based medicine simply does not exist. So this is sort of my opinion of what standard medicine is doing. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So. This is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse base. It's your call. Hello? So in the face of um, great uncertainty, uh, standard medicine is trying to convince us that they have the only holy grail. So in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. So what is functional medicine? My book, Just Be Well, is really about functional medicine. So if you think about standard medicine, in standard medicine when you go to the doctor, he's looking for the diagnosis. He's trying to figure out if you're having a heart attack, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, if you have prostatitis, if you have you know, cystic ovary disease, whatever it might be, he's trying to figure it out. And, f and so, once you have the diagnosis, there is an approved set of treatments. If you have substernal crushing chest pain radiating to your right arm and sweating and a sense of impending doom, you know, you really ought to go to the emergency room. Anybody have those symptoms right now? Besides me, maybe. Um, you should go to the emergency room right now. And the reason why is because you may well be having a heart attack. And if you're having a heart attack, you know, you really don't probably want to go to your acupuncturist. You know, so it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with this model. It's a great model for acute care. If you are crunched in your car, if your car is just crushed around you like a beer can, it's not time to go to your chiropractor. It's time to go to the level one trauma center, right? This is a fantastic model for those kinds of things. Um, but it's a lousy model for most of what ails us, which isn't acute. Most of it is chronic. So in functional medicine, we're trying to restore a high level of wellness. And in a state of high level wellness, your body can't support disease. So it's the opposite, almost. It's the opposite of standard medicine. So here is the functional medicine tree. And everybody comes in right here at signs and symptoms, right? We talked about the substernal chest pain radiating to your left arm and then, you know, diaphoresis, and you go right up here to cardiology. You know, you might go, 
uh, you know, the, the domain of our uh, specialists is up here, whether it's, you know, gastroenterology, I've got these awful belly pains, or, you know, whatever it might be, pulmonology, or I think there's one more there, immunology. But basically, everybody's entering here. And, the, and then we ascend to, into the tiny little branches, and we call these people subspecialists out here. And people are always saying to me, you know, how come you can treat people who have gastrointestinal problems and endocrine problems and cardiac problems and all these different things, and you're not a subspecialist like my cardiologist? Because I'm afraid of heights. See, I go down the tree. I go down. So I look at the fundamental organizing symptoms and, and core, or sy whatever that word is right there, <laughs> symptoms. Uh, systems, thank you, uh, and core clinical imbalances, uh, such as assimilation, which means, you know, digestion and absorption and breathing and things like that, or defense and repair, like your immune system, or we're talking about energy, making energy. We'll talk more about all of these things in a minute. And then even underneath that, what antecedents, what predisposing factors happen? What, what were you born with? You know, what is your genetic predisposition? It's important to remember that your genes are not your destiny. Your genes are a predisposing factor. As an example, if you have a condition no, known as hyperhomocysteinemia, homocysteine is an amino acid that is irritating to the inner lining of the blood vessels. And if you have the right genes, you will have a high level of that, unless you happen to be a person who eats lots of fruits and vegetables, in which case it'll take care of itself and the gene won't matter. So you have a genotype, which is your predisposing risks, and then you have a phenotype, and your phenotype is what you actually exhibit. And what we wanna do is match your genes to your environment so that you exhibit the better half of your genes. In other words, uh, if you're eating the standard American diet, the SAD, or SAD diet, you're much more likely to exhibit inflammatory genes than if we put you on a lot more fruits and vegetables and anti-inflammatory uh, spices and things like that. So these are the trigger, or the antecedents. The triggers are those things that might happen, whether it's a, a car accident that slams your face into the windshield and causes your brain to bounce off of your skull like a big ball of jello and give you a big bruise on your head, or if it's um, not eating enough fruits and vegetables and allowing that uh, homocysteine to manifest. And then mediators are the things that just keep it all going. It's the feed forward thing. It's the dog chasing its tail. So then there's, uh, even underneath that, we get into mental and emotional and spiritual stuff. And I'll tell you that, um, actually just this week, something kind of fun happened. Uh, a woman came in and I've been sort of dancing this dance with her for a long time because uh, her brain, in my opinion, was keeping her sick. I mean, we'd done lots of stuff and she was getting better, but there was just, she was stuck. And she said, you know, on 128, page 128 of your books changed my life. And of course, I haven't read page 128 for months because if I read that book one more time, I'm gonna shoot myself. But because <laughs> through the editing process, all they ever do is, you know, tell you it's wrong and here's all the red ink and do it again. So anyway, I went back and read page 128, and it's um, about some, it's, a, it's about the emotional part and how, you know, we think about, people say psychosomatic illness. Well, so, and then we, and then we get the idea, oh, well, that means it's in my head. Well, given that the most powerful organ in your body happens to reside in your head, the organ in your body that controls your endocrine system, that controls your immune system, that controls your cardiovascular system, yeah, you know what, it could be in your head. It could, but not in the way that people think. Oh, well, you're just weak-minded. No, it's a powerful, powerful organ. So then even down into the roots, we've got you know, sleep. These are all the things that by and large, we all know what we're supposed to do, but don't. You know, like sleeping. I got this um, from the website for the book, justbewell.info, I got this question. She said, I always have a hard time getting started in the morning. What can you tell? You know, so what am I supposed to say? Go, you know, get a stimulant herb or something, right? No, I said, why don't you look right about there? If you're having a hard time getting started in the morning, maybe you should think about the night before. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting restorative sleep? 
And if you're not, well, maybe you should fix that first. <laughs> Are you getting enough movement and exercise? Are you getting enough stress management? Are you getting enough joy? Are you getting enough nutrition and hydration? Do you have enough good bugs in your gut? All of these kinds of things. All right, so the way we do this is, this is actually, I want to tell you something. This is Christy Hughes's invention right here. Um, this is the three-legged stool. Uh, we have something called the patient story retold. I'm going to show you how we figure out the patient story. Normally when you go to the doctor, it's what's wrong right now? Well, I have the sniffles. Okay, well, here's a decongestant. Oh, yeah, and my, my right great big toe hurts. Oh, we have gout. Here's something for that. And by the way, my right elbow hurts. Oh, you probably have tennis elbow. Here's an anti-inflammatory for that. Um, but probably all of those things are related if we think about it in a more global way. So then we have, we organize the clinical imbalances to try to put it all into one piece. And then we modif have modified lifestyle uh, things. And I'll show you that in a minute. So here's our timeline. And this is a tool we use in functional medicine. And look at this. Preconception kind of starts early. You know, it's not, when did the cold start? No, I don't care. I really don't care when your cold started. I care about your preconception. <laughs> I care about prenatal. I care about the antecedents. I care about the triggers. I care about here's where you were born and what happened since all the way out to now. All the signs, symptoms, and diseases and the triggering events. So my biggest interest and people in functional medicine's biggest interest is when did your health first go south? When is the last time you were truly well? That's the question we're interested in. When is the last time you were truly well? Because now we want to investigate that time surrounding when you were truly well. Because if right here is when you were truly well, probably something happened in here, right? Um, I like to tell the story of a patient who's, who came in and she, she said, I've got these joint and muscle pains and it hurts so bad. And I'm sure it's from my Lipitor. My doctor put me on Lipitor, and I know it's the Lipitor. I read all the side effects. I've got every single side effect. Really? Okay. Well, let's, put it, let's just put it down on a timeline. Let's figure it out. Uh, aches and pains start. Starts Lipitor. Hmm. You think that's going to work out? And when you write it down, they go, oh, I was sure it was a Lipitor. Well, it's kind of hard for it to be the Lipitor, right? So we get confused all of us, because we create a story that makes sense to us, and then we stop analyzing it. So you need to start with fresh eyes, start from birth, and we move forward, and we try to find that there's almost always a demarcation where, oh, look, I got sick right here. Oh, look, there was a, I got this really bad virus right here, and then, look, I never really got well. Or I was in that car accident right here, and I never really got well. Or something happened here. So that's what we're looking for. And then we use this thing called the matrix. So we start up here, I started to talk about this earlier, assimilation. How well, how many symptoms do we pile up under this, you know? Well, I've got irritable bowel syndrome and I poop every 10 minutes most days and, um, you know, I've got chronic respiratory disease and I get every cold that goes through town and my joints are inflamed and gosh, I'm tired all the time. And, well, you know, I just am run down, don't feel good, and whatever, and um, my feet are always cold, and I've got, uh, you know, I, my, I've got the best husband, this is a true story, I was told to me, I've got the best husband in the world, but just about once a week, once a month, he turns into a flaming you-know-what. I wonder if it had something to do with the endocrine system, I don't know, uh, of one or the other of them, I don't know which one, but... Um, and then structural integrity, and we're going to look at that in a little more detail. And then here in the middle, notice it's in the center. It's central to all of this, mental, emotional, and spiritual stuff. So, you know, cognitive function, perceptual patterns, emotional state, and meaning and purpose. Meaning and purpose. Now, here's our antecedents, our triggers, and our mediators. And then across here is all the stuff that we sort of know to do and never do, you know? The stuff that we know how to do, like sleep and relax and exercise and nutrition and hydration and stress and resilience and relationships and networks and 
Um, you know, it's amazing. We, we fall in love, we get married, and then we completely ignore our spouse until we're surprised that we're getting a divorce. <laughs> right? uh, if we're not spending some time on this, we're going to get into trouble. So, another video to kind of explain the same goal, different approach. So imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in America, and a Japanese man walks up to you and says, excuse me, what is the name of this block? And you say, well, there's Snyder Ave, there's Reed Ave, that's 27th Street, this is 26th. And he says, uh, yes, but what is the name of that block? You say, I'm sorry, blocks don't have names. Streets have names. Blocks are just the unnamed spaces in between the streets. He leaves a little confused and disappointed. So now imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in Japan, and you turn to the person next to you and you say, excuse me, what is the name of this street? And they say, ah, oh, well, that's block 17, this is block 16. And you say, yeah, but what's the name of this street? They say, well, streets don't have names. Blocks have names. That's block 17, this is 16. Look at the map. There's block 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. All of these blocks have names. Streets are just the unnamed spaces in between the blocks. You're a little confused, but you say, okay, then how do you do your home address? They say, easy. This is District 8, Block 17, House Number 1. You say, okay, but walking around I notice that the house numbers don't go in order. And they say, ah, but they do. They go in the order in which they were built. So the first house ever built on a block is House Number 1. Second house ever built is House Number 2. Third house ever built is House Number 3, etc. So it's funny that sometimes you need to go to the opposite side of the world to realize assumptions you didn't even know you had and that the opposite may also be true. For example, in China, there are doctors that believe it's their job to keep you healthy. So any month you're healthy, you pay them. Any month you're sick, you don't have to pay them. Their job is to get you healthy again so they can get paid again. Kind of cool that they get rich when you're healthy, not sick, right? And this map is also accurate. <laughs> so it's funny, there's this saying in India that whatever true thing you can say about India, the opposite is also true. So never forget that whatever ideas you have or hear, that the opposite may also be true. Domo arigato gozaimasu. So we started out talking about evidence-based medicine and how we're trying to arrive at a diagnosis in order to treat the illness. And we learned how to do an address in the United States. And then we started talking about functional medicine and then how to do an address in Japan. And they both, both ways of doing it work. Um, it's just a different perspective. So I want to go through the outer rim of the matrix for a minute. And I want to talk about it and think about what it means. Assimilation, digestion, absorption, the microbiota. What is that? That's the little microbes that live in your gut. You know, we live in this unbelievably germ-phobic world where we have stuff to pump on our hands and wash it around to kill every last germ and gargle with Listerine to kill every last germ. And uh, the truth is, uh, the microbiota, when they do studies on mice, they have these mice that actually have sterile guts. They don't live as long as mice that have lots of bugs growing in their guts. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And it's probably true for humans too. In fact, the microbiota I'm going to show you in a moment is really important. But the bottom line is, if you aren't digesting efficiently, if you aren't absorbing efficiently, if you don't have a good microbiome, you know, we've got a genome, we've got a proteome, we've got a metabolome, and now we have a microbiome. We have lots of ohms, and we're not even meditating. Um, and then respiration, because in respiration, we're, uh, you know, we're breathing in oxygen, and we're breathing out carbon dioxide, or we're breathing in exhaust, and we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Wait a minute, how come we didn't breathe out exhaust? Because it got stuck in us. It's called toxicity, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So here is a healthy gut. And the big balls here are things that maybe shouldn't be allowed to get in us, and the little balls are things that should be allowed to get in us. And you notice this wavy line here. That's called the microvilli. And it is the microvilli that increase the surface area and let the little balls come in. So now we've got an unhealthy gut. 
Now here's the interesting thing about the unhealthy gut. The immune system lives right here. This is the lumen of the gut. The immune system lives right here. Now, there's leaky stuff between here. We've got some teeth missing here on our, on our uh, microvilli, so not as many of these guys can get absorbed, and stuff that shouldn't be absorbed gets absorbed. So now, I want you to think about a, um, a hunter. A hunter is in the woods, and he has on his full-on regalia. You know, he's got the, the ghillie suit on, you know, the leaves hanging off of him and all that stuff. And he's squatting down low next to a bush, and he's waiting for a deer or a turkey or whatever. And he is super hard to see because he looks just like a bush, right? You take that same guy, and you move him into the parking lot at Walmart. Now, not only is he easy to see, he is seriously scary looking, right? He looks like the guy who's about to shoot up the store. So in the same way, if my eyeballs are my immune system and this, my hands are these cells right here. My hands are the lining of my intestines. 70% of your immune system lines your gut. So I'm like this and I can see a little bit through the cracks. I see people and I think, well, those are people, I'm people, it must be okay. Now, my gut gets a little bit inflamed, a little bit sick, and suddenly I'm looking through my fingers like this, because I got all these leaky holes, right? I'm looking like this now, and I see out there and I go, whoa, these are not me. These people are not me. I'm going to make antibodies and try to defend myself about, against all of those people. Unfortunately for all of you, there are spots on you guys that look just like me. <laughs> And so I make an antibody against one of you, and it accidentally becomes an antibody against me, and I have autoimmune disease. I might have, that might cause me to have autoimmune thyroiditis, it might cause me to have autoimmune arthritis, it might cause me to have any number of different autoimmune problems because my immune system lives right here. If you think about this, lumen, think of a donut. This is the hole in the donut. The donut hole starts right there in someplace else, in the back. As my anatomy professor, an English guy said, out the back passage. Um, so if you think about a donut, you just elongate it, you know, and you pour, pour part forward and the other part back. Uh, it's kind of like a human being. There's a hole going all the way through. It's typically filled with trans fats and simple carbohydrates, kind of like most people. And if we, okay, it wasn't that funny, but I thought it was funny. So, um, so if we think about this lumen as being outside the body, then in a few minutes I'm going to show you why this is the wall of the castle. Here's our gut. Here's the microflora in our gut. The microflora in our gut does all of these things. Remember assimilation, assimilation defense, structure, biotransformation, all of the things in the matrix. The gut um, enhances... Uh, nutrition and metabolism, it actually, your, your gut microflora actually makes certain B vitamins like biotin. It, um, it stimulates the enteric nervous system. It's important for mast cell regulation. Something called short chain fatty acids, which are an important fuel source they make. They do all of these good things. They help reduce inflammation. They help uh, improve detoxification. They help m make healthy biofilms. They do all these good things. So in the end, the microbiome is doing all these good things all the way around the functional medicine matrix. So then we get to defense and repair and the immune system, inflammation, infection. Um, if you tell me the five foods you crave, I guarantee you three of them you're probably allergic to. And why would that be? Well, because when you eat a lot of the food, you're in a position known as antigen excess. And then when you stop eating the food, you move from antigen excess to this thing called equilibrium, and then over here to antibody excess. This, you see, you're not really making large chains of immune complexes, nor over here do you make large chains of immune complexes. But right here, I, I'm allergic to dairy, I don't know. I've eat, drink, eaten a bunch of dairy, I'm over here. I stop eating dairy, I go right there, I get sick, and I think, ooh, I better eat some more dairy. On a subconscious level, you know, like Pavlov and his dogs, on a subconscious level. And so it is here where you get lots of symptoms. So when you're craving foods, think about that. It's probably because you're addicted to them in an in a allergic or... Uh, 
maybe not truly allergic, but immune complex way. And then we have this. We've got our baseline nutritional de deficiencies, maybe, because you're on the SAD diet, the uh, simple carbohydrate and trans fat diet that I just described, which can cause increased basal oxidative stress. So what's oxidative stress? Well, if you have a piece of steel and you oxidize it, we call that rust, right? If you oxidize fat, we call it lipid peroxides, but it's basically rusty fat. If you oxidize DNA, we call it 8-hydroxy-D-guanosine, but it's rusty DNA, and we can measure those things. So, or it impairs your immune system because you don't have enough nutrition to, to make your immune system work where it impairs mucosal defense. Well, that lining I just showed you a minute ago in the gut, that's your mucosa. And if it's not healthy, then stuff leaks through and you get infected. Now that results in um, if the uh, high levels of oxidative stress facilitate viral replication. In other words, you may be aware that when you got chicken pox when you were a kid, that bug has lived in you ever since. And in fact, now you're at risk for getting shingles because it's the exact same bug. And if you're under a tremendous amount of stress, that's when the shingles bug will start to replicate and you'll end up with shingles. But there's CMV, there's all kinds of other viruses and other bugs that just take up residence in us and just live there forever. Uh, anyway, this, this also facilitates uh, viral mutations. All of this increases your susceptibility to infection. Uh, increased susceptibility to infection causes increased severity and frequency and duration of infection. And then this causes uh, exacerbations of ex oxidative stress. It causes you to not eat well. It causes you to have more mucosal damage and all of this feeds back. And guess what? We're back to the dog chasing its tail. I have a... Uh, five-month-old Newfoundland who now weighs 70 pounds. He's 70 pounds worth a puppy chasing his tail in the middle of the living room. And if that's anything like this, it's a real tornado. Um, what can happen now? We have all of these various mechanisms going on, and I already talked about autoimmunity on one level. Well, your thyroid is susceptible, your brain is susceptible, your bones are susceptible, your muscles, your skin, your lungs, your nerves, your digestive tract, and even your blood. Now, if you don't need any of these systems or tissues, then you don't need to worry about anything I'm talking about. But um, I didn't get enough of this one for sure, so I need to be careful about all this stuff. And when you think about it, all of this stuff is stuff we already know how to do. We just don't do it, right? It's digestion, it's absorption, it's rest, it's exercise. It's all the things we know how to do. And it's having a little bit of finesse added. Um, the things that Dr. Hughes works on every day is matching your genome to your environment so that you don't get mismatches and you don't get the problems and we restore them. So now we're to the energy part. So here is a thing called a mitochondria. So this is a cell, this whole thing is a cell, and in fact in here these are all, this is endoplasmic reticulum and microtubules, and I'm telling you that because I'm going to show you a cool video in a minute. And this is a mitochondria. Now what happens is food gets digested in your gut someplace, gets into your blood, comes around, gets transported into the cell, comes to the mitochondria, and the mitochondria makes something called ATP. So here's fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Gets metabolized in various ways to become all these big words, which are not important, but um, just to show you how smart I am, I'll tell you that's acetyl-CoA, and it combines with oxaloacetate to become citric acid and sisaconitate, and isocitrate, and alpha-ketoglutarate, and succinate. And you can have all kinds of problems along here. As an example, if you're metabolizing a fat and we measure, these things are all things we measure in the, in the body, and we find you have a whole bunch of this stuff. Well, it turns out instead of the fat going efficiently to here, it's taking this turn and it's getting stuck over here. And that might be because we don't have enough carnitine or magnesium. Or if the carbohydrates are coming over here, maybe we don't have enough magnesium, lipoic acid, B1 or B2 or B3. Or maybe we have too much arsenic, antimony, or mercury over here. Or if we're coming down here and all of a sudden this is normal and there's none of this, well, it seems like there's a dam right there. So maybe we don't have enough magnesium, B1, B2, B3, or again, these toxic heavy metals again. So this gives us clues as to what might be going haywire if you're not feeling really energetic. Biotransformation. This, uh, you are what you eat, right? 
You are what you eat, think, breathe, believe, and don't detoxify. <laughs> don't eliminate. So we have to detoxify. So here's our castle. This is, our, this is my diagram of the human body. We always talk about the human body as the temple, right? Well, it's not, I don't, I don't think of it as a temple. I think of it as a serious full-on castle with a drawbridge and a moat and up on the top of some big hill and really hard to get to. The moat, by the way, and the drawbridge, right there's the mouth. Typically, if you've ever been to Europe, um, you know, you see a castle. It's almost always on the top of a hill. There's some town built around the castle on the hill, and all of the roads leading to it are really circuitous with lots of dead ends and weird turns and... It's all designed to make it difficult for the marauding army to get to the castle in the first place. Once they get to the castle, there's almost always a courtyard, an outer courtyard, and then a central courtyard. And so the outer courtyard, or the, the mouth, is the drawbridge. The lining of our gut is the wall, and our immune system are the knights standing on the wall, right? Now, if you have leaky gut, there's a very strange circulation to the liver. Only one pla two places in the body has this circulation. Uh, what happens most of the time is it goes from the heart uh, to an organ and then back to the heart. In, in the case of the liver, it goes from the heart to the small intestine to the liver and then back to the heart. So in a way, this is the inner courtyard of the, of the castle. And things are supposed to, toxins come in, they get affected by phase one, then phase two, they get, produce water-soluble byproducts, and they either get eliminated by the kidney or the gallbladder and out through the stool. But there's a, it's a little more complicated than that because you need all of these things to make phase one happen. And you need, look at this right here, ATP. You need all of these things to make phase two happen. If you don't have enough of these things, you make reactive intermediates. These things are rust promoters. These are oxidative stress promoters. As an example, um, Tylenol. If you take too much Tylenol, you will use up all of your glutathione. When you use up all your glutathione, your body will take the Tylenol in here, it'll get it to there, and it'll be stuck. And when it gets stuck there, guess what happens? The reason you die from Tylenol overdose is because it kills your liver. It kills your liver because you get stuck right there. And it's basically pouring gasoline on a fire in your, in your uh, liver. So we have to have all these things. If we don't have all these things, we get imbalanced detoxification, which is actually worse than the toxin itself often. Transport. This is basically the cardiovascular system. It's basically plumbing. <laughs> There's our medical plumber. And uh, it's interesting that most of us think that the, uh, the lumen of the gut just kind of shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. But look at this, big, big, big blowout. It's, it's not, it's the ones that cause a heart attack are this blowout. And the problem is all of this metabolic activity, all of this abnormality is related to mismatch of your genes and your environment. This is the guy who has high homocysteine. He gets all of this inflammatory process going on in the middle layer of the, of the uh, lumen or the mid layer of the blood vessel, and then it causes this rupture and problem. So plumbing can happen and transport can happen not only on the grand scale of the arteries, but on the miniature scale. So here's the cell wall. Here's one of those mitochondria we looked at. Here's another mitochondria. This is a big thing called the endoplasmic reticulum. Right here are something called microfilaments and then microtubules right here. This is something called kinesin. My son, who's a PhD in physics, biophysics, he studies kinesin. And this vesicle, this is a big cargo. This thing is like a cargo transport device. And it looks like this. Uh, this is the kinesin right here. And this is our best guess is how this stuff works. So these are the two motor proteins at the bottom. And these are dragging this gigantic cargo across the cell, just yanking it across the cell, taking it. Maybe this is a bunch of medium chain triglycerides and it's being taken to a mitochondria to be burned to make ATP or whatever. So there's all of this elegant biochemistry and this crazy detail going on inside your cells. And these are actually highways taking the cargo to places it wants to go. So you can imagine if you don't have enough ATP, this little guy isn't walking your cargo where you need to. If you don't have the right uh, vitamins and minerals to make these microtubules, things aren't going where they want to go. Endocrine system. I'll just let you stare at that for a second. <laughs> My wife told me she didn't think this was true, it wasn't accurate, but seems kind of accurate. 
Um, endocrine system, think about this. We've got the pineal gland, the, all of these glands everywhere, but I want to do a little pop quiz. So what organ of the body produces three quarters of all of the neurotransmitters and hormones? What organ of the body contains about two thirds of all the immune system tissue? What organ of the body contains 10 times more cells than the rest of the body combined? What organ of the body houses a genome that's about 100 times larger than the human genome? And what organ of the body has a metabolic activity greater than the liver? The gut. The gut. So we think about the endocrine system and we start thinking about the brain, we think about the ovaries, we think about the testes, we think about any number of things. The gut. The gut. The naturopathic tradition, especially in England, they say death begins in the gut. Well, I think life begins in the gut also. Structure. We often think of structure as this kind of thing, right? Somebody just blew out their knee or whatever. But here's another place of structure. This is a cell membrane. And this is, the cell membrane is what they call a lipid bilayer. That means that this is a fat and this is a fat. There's two layers of fat here. And then floating in the fat, there are these protein receptors. And let's just assume for a minute that this is a insulin receptor. Now, if you are made out of fats that are basically solid at room temperature, you're going to have stiff membranes, right? If you have stiff membranes, it's going to be hard for this guy to float around and do its job the way it's supposed to. If you have adult onset diabetes, as an example, you probably have stiff cellular membranes. And if you have stiff cellular membranes, you become what's called insulin resistant. And when you become insulin resistant, your insulin doesn't work the way it's supposed to. You need more and more. And in, in uh, diabetes, adult onset diabetes, you start out with this balance between insulin and sugar. And then your sugar starts to rise because you, because you become insulin resistant. So your, your pancreas says, oh, better make more insulin, and that drives your blood sugar back down. And then it rises again, and you make more insulin, and it drives your sugar back down, and keeps driving, you get this ratchet going. Pretty soon, you're making as much insulin as you possibly can, and you continue to become insulin resistant, and now your sugar starts to rise unchecked. And at some point, it crosses a line of 126 milligrams per deciliter, and we say, aha! You have diabetes. Now we know what's wrong. It's diabetes. Well, shouldn't we have figured it out long before you got across that line? That's insulin resistance. And we want to diagnose insulin resistance because what we really want to do, instead of worrying about uh, diagnosing insulin resistance, we want to make sure that your membranes have plenty of fats in them that are liquid at room temperature. So maybe instead of lard, maybe a little bit of... Uh, olive oil or flax oil or other healthy oils. So this is also structure. So it comes back to diet, doesn't it? And then these are all the things that we all sort of know how to do and forget. And this stuff, this stuff, this stuff, this stuff, this is so important. Um, if we're not talking about meaning and purpose in a medical setting, we're missing the boat. We live in such a frenetic, crazy world that meaning is gone. What's my meaning? I don't have a meaning. I go to work. I go to work, I come home. I go to work, I come home. I go to work, I come home. Well, and you know, people think that their job is meaningless. I don't know about any of you, but I was in New York City during a garbage strike. I'm going to tell you something. The garbage collection people, they have serious, important meaning. Because it's really unpleasant to walk down the streets of New York City when there's garbage everywhere. There is no job that is meaningless. It is really important, but it's really easy. I will tell you that my baseline personality is just another brick in the wall, you know? I think that my world, any, but anything I'm doing couldn't be that important because I'm doing it, right? Well, even when you get feedback like, gee, page 128 changed my life. Every single day, I have to remind myself that what I do is purposeful and has meaning just like everyone else. And it's important because without purpose and meaning, why are we here? And what are we doing? And yet we forget. And then the emotional piece. 
and the cognitive function, all of this. This stuff, if, you know, this is all stuff we ignore and it's sort of embarrassing because, gosh, it's in our head. This is important. And then all the things we know how to do. So this periphery and the center of the matrix, these are really important. If we don't have the, the periphery and the center, we're not going to win all the way around here. This is what our personal viewpoint should look like. But it looks like this often, doesn't it? I know I'm supposed to be well, but oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Here's one more thing. So this is about caring. And having all of the parts fit together. I'm told that the first take, the guy, you notice he had his elbow come up over the little girl's head. I'm told he whacked her good enough to almost give her a black eye. So, so I want to go through a quick case with the no time we have left. Um, so this is a woman, 48 years old, has about seven years of development of progressive severe AM stiffness. It, when it first started, she saw her primary care doctor who diagnosed her with plantar fasciitis. She was prescribed stretching exercises, physical therapy, some orthotics, and it really didn't help. So she progressed and they gave her some steroid injections and that gave her moderate relief. Um, unfortunately, it was not very long lived. So over the next year or so, her symptoms generalized to include most of her muscles and joints. She was seen by a rheumatologist, one of those specialists up in the twigs, who gave her a diagnosis of mixed collagen vascular disease and started her on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, which, by the way, uh, increase your risk of heart disease and other problems. But it helped her to some degree for a while, and then her problem escalated to the point where she needed intermittent um, <clears throat> excuse me, intermittent and then long-term steroids. Prednisone is a steroid. And then she went on to need um, a first uh, methyltrexate and then hydrochloroquine, which are both what are called DMARs or uh, disease-modifying drugs. And then eventually she needed one of what I call, this is a, a doctor joke, all of these uh, generic names have these really long multisyllabic names, so I call them all alphabitimabs. Uh, but anyway, Embryl, which basically is designed to kill a part of your immune system, that's what it does. And it, they work great for reducing the, um, the symptoms of your disease, but if you read the list of things that could happen, like cancer and reactivating tuberculosis and all kinds of things, they may not be the ideal first choice. So here's her um, timeline. And this is kind of interesting. Um, antecedent, she has diabetes and heart disease in her family, obesity and seasonal affective disorder. And then in her personal history, she had this really contentious and difficult divorce. And then she got in this motor vehicular accident. And I'll show you in a minute how it impacted her nutrition. So irregular menses since menarche, um, divorce and ongoing stress related to the divorce. And then she kind of, she went from kind of being a cook and kids and all that to living in an apartment by herself and kind of hating her entire worldview and stopping cooking. And then she got in this really nasty car accident. She broke her jaw, or I guess she, she didn't break her jaw. She got whiplash and really bad TMJ and they actually, uh, she wasn't able to chew. So she went on this liquid diet of this commercially available diet drink 
which is basically made out of sugar. Tiny bit of protein and a lot of sugar. And uh, then after that, so not well since, well about right here, progressive joint uh, started with plantar fasciitis, but just before that, motor vehicular accident and really a major dive in her nutrition. And then uh, progressive pain, Celebrex, all these drugs, blah, blah, blah. So from my perspective, she has this huge stress Huge stress, so that's probably wearing on her immune system. Then she gets in this motor vehicular accident, um, and she starts drinking this liquid diet. So now she's got huge stress and no nutrition, and then she gets sick. So I'm thinking, you know, this is the not well sense moment, and I'm thinking about all this stuff. So I think, gosh, I wonder what that looks like on a matrix. So here's her matrix. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing in a ton of detail, but just say poor diet, nutrition, high sugar foods, IBS, I forgot to tell you that part. She had irritable bowel syndrome, probably from her high stress and so on. She had lots of inflammation uh, in her joints. Her ANA was positive. She was on this drug called Embryl. Energy was really, she was super fatigued. Biotransformation, she's on uh, all these drugs, and that's probably stressing her, her body's capacity to detoxify. She has lots of stress and insulin resistance is likely because she had central obesity. If you're apple shaped, you're probably insulin resistant. In other words, if you, if you put all your fat right here, you're probably insulin resistant. Again, poor nutrition compromises structure and so on. And then she's a, she works night shifts, plus she picks up, an, she's an RN actually, and she picks up an extra shift here and there to make ends meet because now she's a single mom. So she is like totally stressed to the max. And not only is she stressed at home, but her job is extremely stressful. She's, she's a critical care nurse. I mean, tell me a job more stressful than that. Um, you know, the doctors think, this is the thing that makes me crazy. The doctors think that they're like, you know, they've got it all and they have all the stress. Yeah, well, what about, what about the nurse who's the one in there all day, every day, actually making the decision turn up the drip, turn down the drip, and then the nurse, you know, runs into a little problem, has to call the doctor and gets an earload from the doctor because they woke him up in the middle of the night. I just have no respect for that at all. <laughs> Nurses have the hardest job in medicine, period. Nutrition and hydration, well, guess what? It was crummy and it was pro-inflammatory. Stress and resilience, she works and, and work and home stress was off the charts and few if any relationships because she's busy trying to make ends meet. So the patient was initially placed on what we call an elimination diet, anti-inflammatory medical food, some fish oil, and a high potency probiotic and an immune globulin. This is what I call Dr. Salt's magic formula. And this is just sort of where I start with most patients because almost everybody has problems in those areas. But then um, I, um, I measure these things. I send off labs. So six weeks follow-up, the patient has little improvement overall. She has maybe a little less gas and bloating, but her body pain is not improved. Her labs show that she has very low omega-3 fatty acids. That's basically fish oil, flax oil, walnut oil, things like that. She has very low antioxidant capacity, and she has crummy B vitamin status. She has elevated lead and mercury in her system. So we put her on a program to fix all that stuff. And she comes back in 12 weeks. Now, that's three months. Three months. She's been doing this with me for three months. And uh, she's generally worse. Generally worse. And any rational human being is saying, this guy's a moron. I am out of here. But fortunately, I had a little conversation with her that maybe it would get worse before it got better. So her energy level is a little lower. Her body aches are actually a little worse. Because we had this uh, discussion, she decides to push forward. I add this thing called a super green food and some other supplements to enhance detoxification. So here we are now at 18 weeks. She notices modest improvement in her energy level and her pain. She also felt that her GI uh, function was improving and she was beginning to lose some weight for the first time in years. 24 weeks. She's now about a six out of 10. Um, she tried to reintroduce foods. Uh, and I told her, you know, if foods don't give her side effects, just leave them in. And if they do give her side effect, think about rescheduling a reintroduction again in three months. So now she comes back at 30 weeks. 
and she's reintroduced most foods, but she finds that nightshade vegetables, dairy, and gluten bother her. When she eats nightshades, her joints hurt. When she eats dairy or gluten, her gut hurts. So guess what? Don't eat those things. She continues to improve and describes herself as about a 7 out of 10, with 10 being ideal health. She continues to have slow, progressive weight loss. At this point, she's lost about 15 pounds. And a year out, she's an 8 plus out of 10. She, her joint pain is essentially resolved. Her IBS is essentially resolved. Her, uh, she's active in her community. She's entered a new relationship, which she's very happy about. And the reason she's not higher than an 8 is because she still has weight to lose. <laughs> so her biggest problem in her life right now, uh, besides you know, normal life, is that she has weight to lose. So this is the power of functional medicine. She's, by the way, an eight, and a half, 8 out of 10 off of all of her medicines. So this is the power of functional medicine instead of trying to treat each individual disease, trying to restore optimal wellness.